I'm here to speak about um, Russia and my fight with Russia um, and, and the fact that they, um, the Russian government murdered my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. Now, whenever, um, whenever I give a talk um, uh, about this fight that I'm involved in, um, the first question that, that pops up into people's minds is, um, uh, how did this guy with an American accent end up in this, in this whole situation? And so let me tell you a little bit about myself, and then let me tell you the story of Sergei Magnitsky. Um, I'm indeed from America, but I come from a very unusual American family. Uh, my grandfather uh, was a, a labor union organizer from Wichita, Kansas. And um, he was so good at organizing the union that the Russians said, if you like labor unionism, you're going to love communism. Why don't you come to Russia? He went to Moscow in 1927. He met my grandmother in, in Moscow, who was a Russian woman. And um, my father was born there. And then they returned to America in 1932, um, where he became head of the American Communist Party for the next 13 years. He ran for president twice on the communist ticket. So if you come from a family of communists, um, and you're going through your teenage rebellion, as I did, how do you rebel from a family of communists? <laughs> I put on a suit and a tie, and I became a capitalist. <laughs> I graduated from business school in 1989, which was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And I said to myself, um, if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America, I'm going to go become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And so I, I moved to Europe, and um, I eventually set up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund in Russia, which was to invest in the stock market of Russia. And um, my fund became very, very successful very quickly. And um, uh, as I was um, settling into this, into this profession, I discovered that all of my investments in these Russian companies, and these were very large state-owned companies like Gazprom and others, I discovered that all the money that was being invested, or all the money in these companies was being stolen by the managements of these companies. And as an investor, if all the money that you're, uh, in your companies is being stolen, then it's not a very good thing. And so I said to myself, how am I going to um, fight the stealing that's going on inside these companies? And I had no particular skills, um, political skills or, or anything like that, but I had one very good skill uh, among my staff, which was to research how they did the stealing, and then to take that research and to share it with the international media. And so for about a four-year period, we would do these big forensic studies of how stealing would go on at big state-owned companies in Russia. And then we would share it with the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Business Week, et cetera. Now, this had a remarkable effect on the value of my portfolio because when we exposed the corruption, the share prices went up, and so I felt very happy. <laughs> I also felt very happy that I was getting the bad guys. There's nothing more gratifying than um, getting the bad guys. And so I had, about a, uh, I had a, a perfect life for about four years when I, from when I started this um, until 2005. And um, uh, in 2005, the people who I had been exposing apparently had had enough. And as I was flying back to Moscow after living there for 10 years, and having created, by the way, the largest foreign investment fund in the country, I was stopped at the border, I was detained for 15 hours, and then I was deported from Russia and declared a threat to national security. At that point um, is where the terrible story begins, and what I'm about to describe to you is, is truly one of the, the most horrible thing that I could think of to happen, and I'm sure there are other stories here as well like that. Uh, but 18 months after I was expelled, um, 25 police officers raided, the of my, raided my offices in Moscow, and 25 more officers raided the office of my American law firm they were looking specifically for the stamps, seals, and certificates for our investment holding companies. They grabbed all these documents, they took them away, and the next thing we knew, we no longer owned our investment holding companies. The police had seized the documents and stolen our investment holding companies. Now, at this point, I, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a businessman. I went out and hired a team of lawyers. I hired seven lawyers, including a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. He was a 36-year-old lawyer from an American law firm and one of the smartest lawyers I knew in Moscow. I asked Sergei to investigate and to figure out what, it, what this was all about. And Sergei went out and investigated, and he came back, and he said, um, not only have these people stolen your companies, but through a very complicated scheme, 
Um, these people have stolen $230 million of taxes that you paid to the Russian government. They tried to steal your money, they didn't succeed, but they ended up stealing the taxes that you paid to the Russian government. I was, I was amazed that a group of police officers, apparently tax officials, and criminals could steal $230 million from the Russian government. And so we decided that this must be a rogue operation because how could it possibly be authorized to steal government money by government officials? And we figured if we exposed it, if we put it out into the open and we exposed how they went about stealing the money, um, that the good guys would get the bad guys and that would be the end of the story. And so we filed nine different criminal complaints with all the different law enforcement agencies in Russia and we thought to ourselves, that imminently the SWAT teams and helicopters will be out getting the bad guys. Well, it turned out that there are no good guys in Russia, only bad guys. And instead of the SWAT teams and helicopters going after the bad guys, um, they opened up criminal cases against all seven of our lawyers from four different law firms. Now, I'm trained as a fund manager, not as a soldier, and the, and the idea of putting people in harm's way is something that I don't have the psychological capacity to do, and so I, I immediately asked each one of my lawyers to leave Russia, um, to come to London at my expense, and stay in London at my expense to get out of harm's way. It wasn't an easy conversation to have to ask people from, to leave their own country um, on a moment's notice and to go into exile, but six of my seven lawyers accepted my invitation and came to London. And I would say that they did so under duress. Nobody really wanted to go, and they were very reluctant to do it. But six of the seven lawyers accepted my invitation. The one who didn't was Sergei Magnitsky. He was about a decade younger than the rest. He hadn't seen the capriciousness of the Soviet regime as a grown-up, and he didn't know how bad things could get. And he stayed. He said, I haven't broken any laws. I'm not going to leave. He stayed in Russia. And then he did something remarkably brave which was in October of 2008, he testified against the police officers who raided our office. He testified against them providing detailed evidence, basically proving their complicity. Um, and uh, one month after his testimony, on November 24th, 2008, two officers who, were, who had reported to the, one of the people he testified against came to his home at eight in the morning in front of his wife and two children, arrested Sergei, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds and left lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in Moscow in December, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They would regularly miss feeding him for up to 36 hours. After six months of this mistreatment and torture, um, he began to get sick. He developed very severe pains in his stomach. He lost 20 kilos, and he was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones. And an operation was scheduled for the 1st of August 2009 to deal with this illness. One week before the operation was supposed to happen, he was abruptly moved from the prison that had the medical facilities to a prison called Butyrka, which is a maximum security prison considered to be one of the toughest in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei, Butyrka has no medical facilities. At Butyrka, his health completely broke down. It went into a, do a terrible downward spiral. He went into constant agonizing pain, and they refused him all medical treatment. He wrote desperately 20 different requests in writing to every different branch of the Russian penal, judicial, and law enforcement system asking for medical attention. Every single one of his requests was either ignored or rejected in writing. And then on the night of November 16th, 2009, 358 days after he had been arrested, he went into critical condition. On that night, the prison authorities decided to move him to a prison that had a medical facility. But when he arrived at the new prison, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him for one hour and 18 minutes until he died at the age of 37. How do we know all this? We know this because Sergei Magnitsky wrote it all down. He did something which was unprecedented in the Russian prisons, which was every day when something bad happened to him, he wrote it down in the form of a criminal complaint. He wrote 450 criminal complaints 
in his 358 days in detention, which documented right down to the detail who did what to him, when, how, where, and why. And as a result of these 450 complaints, we have the most well-documented human rights abuse case that's come out of Russia in the last 35 years. This was not, this is not a matter of conjecture. This is a matter of evidence, and the evidence from Sergei. And then since then, corroborating evidence from the Russians' own um, uh, documentary, the way they've documented um, all of the ways they treated him. We figured, because we have such a well-documented case, they would have to punish the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky. It just it seemed impossible that they couldn't. It was a well-publicized, well-documented case. But they didn't. Instead, the Russian authorities did something very horrible, which was they said, Sergei Magnitsky wasn't sick. There was no violence involved in his death. There wasn't a single person involved in doing this to him. And um, instead, they ended up promoting the officers who were most involved, giving them state honors, and then most shockingly, um, they put Sergei Magnitsky on trial after he's dead in the first ever trial against a dead man in the history of Russia. Well, if we can't get justice inside of Russia, let's get justice outside of Russia. And that's what we said. How do we get justice outside of Russia? And the way we get justice outside of Russia is the people who committed this crime didn't do this for religion or ideology or ethnicity. They did this for money. And the people who do this type of thing for money don't like to keep their money in Russia. They like to keep it in the West. They like to travel to the West. They like to send their kids to school in the West. And we said to ourselves, if we can take away their ability to do this, um, then th this is some type of justice. Not real justice, but some type of justice. And so I went to Washington, and I ended up getting Senator Cardin, a Democrat from Maryland, and Senator McCain, a Republican from Arizona, to sponsor what's been, called, what's been known now as the Magnitsky Act which imposes visa sanctions and asset freezes on the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky. The Magnitsky Act was launched as a proposal in October of 2010, and it touched the Russian people in a way that nobody expected. And every other victim started coming forward to Washington and saying, this is the most powerful tool you could use against these people. My father, my brother, my sister, um, my son was killed under similar circumstances. Could you please add the people who did this to the bill? And so they widened the bill, not just to include Sergei Magnitsky, but to include others. The bill was passed last December um, with 92, uh, 92 senators against four in the Senate, 89% of the House of Representatives. President Obama signed the bill on December 12th. And this is now the new technology for fighting human rights abuse. Targeted sanctions, visas, and freezing their assets. And this doesn't necessarily need to be just for Russia. This can be for everywhere. There's a big appetite in Washington to do this for the rest of the world. And we're ro rolling this out across Europe. And I would encourage everybody here to join me in this campaign to use this as the tool for fighting human rights abuse in a global world where people are moving around and putting their money and taking their money around, this is the one thing that really touches them. And I can tell you how much this has touched them because Putin has now gone completely out of his mind about this. I'm now the single number one enemy of the Russian state because this thing really truly touches them. Thank you. Thank you.